So that's enough of the commercials. Grab your Bibles, please, and open to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. If you're wondering, like, the, the, the program says Galatians. Yeah, we're, we're going through Galatians here, verse by verse. We've been doing that since August of last year. We are in the middle of chapter 5. But I was, I was working on a message for Galatians. And, and as I'm thinking and praying and thinking and praying, just really believed that God wanted us to go in this direction this morning. So, and the um, funny thing is that, you know, I never know. Like, God, is that you? Is that me? Is that the pizza I ate or whatever? And... Um, And then standing at the door at the end of the service, multiple people coming up to me saying, I needed to hear that. One woman, tears in her eyes, I needed to hear that today. So I really believe after that that this really is God's will for our church this morning. So Ephesians chapter 2, go ahead and drop down to verse 19. If you got a Bible from an usher and you're still looking, that's page 1079, 1079 in the blue Bibles. And when you get to Galatians 2, 19, please stand. We, uh, you know, church is very informal in a lot of ways. And I mean, even me, I'm here in jeans and a polo shirt that's not tucked in. Some of you are better dressed than I am <laughs> right now. But we add this bit of formality to our service on purpose because in the midst of, you know, come as you are and hear of a Savior who will accept you as you are, we want to add this piece of formality and the recognition that what we are doing right now is we are reading the actual words of the living God. These are his words that he wants to speak to us. And so let's listen to what he says. Ephesians 2.19. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. That's God's word. You may be seated. And as you are seated, please join me in prayer one more time. God, this is such a critical passage. It's critical for a lot of reasons, but for us this morning, it is critical for us to understand what a church is what it means for people to be the church. And so God, I pray that for us this morning. I pray that the three metaphors, the three pictures we're gonna see in this passage will help us understand not just what the church is in general, but how this church is supposed to be, how we're supposed to interact, the way that we're supposed to be with each other. I pray that this this passage will inform it. And God, just like I I pray for a church every Sunday, a different church, because I I want that kind of unity, not just here in our church, but across the churches in our valley. God, I pray simultaneously for our Spanish church that meets at 1.30, the the Proyecta Vida, who meets here. But I also pray for Iglesia Vida in Chandler. God, Pastor Abel this morning, his service just started seven minutes ago. And so they're already into it. They're already singing right now, probably. And so, God, I pray for the kind of unity and togetherness and oneness that, 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 that we're going to see in this passage. I pray that for, for Inglesia Vida. I pray that for Proyecta Vida. I pray that for, for these two churches. I pray that you would bless them. I pray that you would bring that kind of togetherness, that any strife that may be there, that any, any contention, any disunity, I pray that you would fix that even this morning through the preaching of your word. I pray that you would see speak to hearts, that you would work in hearts, and that you would open eyes to their need, to to all of our needs, to be at peace, and to love one another, and to, to bear with one another, to put up with one another, to forgive each other. God, I, 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 the world looks on and wonders about a Savior whose church is so divided. So I pray that you would cause unity as a result of this message here at Redeemer, but also in the two other churches. I pray for really in all of the churches that love Jesus in this valley, would you unite us more and more as we act in our lives and in our interaction with other Christians, as we act what is true about us, as we'll see in this passage this morning. It's in your name that I pray, Jesus. Amen. So four years ago, I got the privilege of doing two weddings in 24 hours. 
And that was super fun. I got to marry two sets of friends. I was their pastor in the past. And, and that was actually the second time I did that. I did that once before in 2010. Same thing. Two weddings in 24 hours. Some people were at both weddings. It was just an incredibly fun time. And uh, in, I love weddings. I get the best seat in the house as the pastor. You know, I get to see their faces while all of you see their backs. It's fantastic. But um, as I'm, I've, you know, as pastors, we have all kinds of wedding sermons. And one of my wedding sermons takes marriage and compares it to a painting and talks about encouraging the, the, the new bride and the, the, the new groom to, uh, to, or the new husband and wife, actually, to, to have a masterpiece marriage. And I say that this is done when you do what God tells you to do. So as a, as a husband, the, the, your responsibility is to love your wife and care for your wife like Christ loves the church. And as a wife, your responsibility is to follow your husband, picturing a church that follows Jesus. And I say, if you do this, your marriage will be a masterpiece because it will be doing what God designed your marriage to do, which is to be a picture of Christ in the church. And often pictures help us, right? When, when we don't understand something, when something's fuzzy in our brains, some, a, a, a good teacher will give us an illustration and that will just, that, that'll make it all make sense. And that's what we're going to see this morning. Paul, the master teacher, gives us three metaphors, three pictures that illustrate the unity of the church, the unity, the together, togetherness, the oneness. Now, this exists in the universal church, the all believers that exist on the planet today. But the idea here is that we would be what we are, that we, that we would strive to be this unified, this together as a local body of believers. So these three pictures are what every church actually is. This is what we're, we're about. When, when, when I pray for another church, this is what I'm praying for. Not that we would be unified spiritually. We already are that. But that we would be, we would be unified practically, actually, in our everyday interaction with other Christians. So that, that's what I pray for every week. But today is about unity within our own church. The question these pictures leave us with are, are we now what we already are? Are we being now, as, as a church, what we already are? You know, are, are we helping to make this happen? These pictures then help us evaluate, you know, not just how am I being at this church, but maybe you're, this is your first time. And so you're like, has this been my experience in the churches I've been to before? Or if you're like, I've never been to a church ever, this is my first time. Then what this passage helps you do is it helps you know, is the church living up to what Jesus wants it to be? Are we, and I'll say more about this later, but, but are we fulfilling the prayer that Jesus prayed right before the cross? So the first metaphor, as we looked at this text and just read it, is that the church is, is a city, or the way that I put it here for, for point number one, the, the metaphor is, is the church is the city of God. So Paul reminds his readers, before jumping into what it is, he, he reminds them of what, what they were before. Notice in verse 19, he says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens. A stranger is used for a person who is allowed to be in a country but has no rights in that country. That would be like a tourist, all right? When you travel across into another country, you were in that country. You had no rights in that country at all. You could be there, but that was it. And that word alien in verse 19 is someone who actually lives in the country but wasn't a citizen of that country. So we'd call them like a, a resident alien today. So the, the idea of verse 19 is that the people, those strangers and aliens have no rights, no privileges. Though they're in the country, they don't really belong there. But Paul's saying this is, this is what you were and what you were doesn't determine what you are. Notice those words in verse 19. You are no longer strangers and aliens. You were outside the city, but now notice you are in the city and in the city you are fellow citizens with the saints. So today we think of citizens as belonging to certain countries. But in ancient times, citizens belonged to certain cities. You were a citizen of a specific city. Now look back at verse 19. The, the fellow citizens is the opposite of the word stranger. This is someone who, has a, who is at home. This is someone who belongs. This is someone with all the rights and privileges of a citizen. The idea here is that all Christians everywhere on the planet today are fellow citizens. They share the same address in the city of God. Now imagine all of us having the same address right now. You know, it'd be kind of weird because we know people at various levels and most of the people you probably don't in this room, you probably don't know at all. The idea here, though, is that this is what we are spiritually. And one day, every believer in this room and every believer on the planet will, will have the same address. We'll have the same address in the city of God. So keep your finger here, your little ribbon, and turn to Hebrews 
chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. This city of God imagery is something that the writer to the Hebrews talked about in Hebrews chapter 11. Starts with Abraham, and if you drop down to Hebrews 11 verse 10, He's talking about Abraham, the the man of faith, the father of faith, the one who trusted in God and it was credited to him as righteousness. We've saw that multiple times as we've been going through Galatians. Well, what is it that he was believing in? He believed in God. He believed in the Messiah, the promises at least, but, but there's more. Look at Hebrews chapter 11, drop down to verse 10. For he, that was Abraham, was looking forward to the city. So he was looking off into the future to the city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. So there's this city he's looking forward to. He's not in it now, but he's looking forward to the day that he will be. Turn to Hebrews 12. Hebrews chapter 12. The writer continues on this theme. And Hebrews 12 drop down to verse 22. So now he's talking to believers and he's saying, this is, this is what you've come to. This is where you are. Hebrews 12, 22. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. Remember those words, those, the assembly enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks better than the blood of Abel. So, to that, this, this right here is our residence. This is your address, along with every other Christian alive today. Notice too, Paul didn't say, you will be fellow citizens, like one day, like when you're dead, or one day at the end of time. He says, this is your address now. So being a Christian means all of these blessings are ours now, and we just await the greater experience. Like I said before, that's true of us spiritually, and we are waiting what we will be practically. And when we are practically experiencing this, we will be living in the city of God, the new Jerusalem. That will be our home. And what, in other words, all we are down here, we are on vacation now. This, we are strangers and aliens, not there, but here. This is not our home. We're passing through. This is momentary and light affliction that is not even close to being able to, to even, even compare to what we're going to see in the future, that that is your address, that is your home, you're on vacation here, death is not a permanent vacation, it is your ticket home, that is your address, you are just simply passing through this place, but it's not just you personally, see that's what happens when I say you, you take that as you personally, but it's you, all of us, all of us, this is where we will all be one day, we're all together in this room right now. We will never have the same people in this room right now as we have right now. But there will be a day when all of the saved in this room, all the saved alive today, all the saved of all ages, will all be together in the same address in the city of God. So when I was in high school, I got to go to a movie premiere. I lived in California and uh, all the who's who of Hollywood was there not that night and the biggest star in the room was Arnold Schwarzenegger. You know, I'm super excited. If you go through my Facebook pictures, you'll see little 17-year-old me with uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. And uh, all kinds of people went into that, uh, that, that venue, but everyone was not allowed in. Unlike those standing outside, I walked up to the front with my friend, and I, I, we, we gave the, the guy at the door our names, and our names were on the list, and so we got to go right in. My name being on the list meant that I belonged there. Well, look back at verse 23. If you are a believer, your name, you are enrolled in heaven. You have a place there. Your name is on that list. Now, some movie premiere pales in comparison to the exclusive access you will have to the kingdom, to the, to the city of God. It's the hottest ticket in town. It'll be the hottest ticket in eternity. And on that roll sheet is going to be your name. There's not going to be some VIP lounge, I don't think. We're all, we're all going to be united. We're all going to be residents there, citizens, fellow citizens, all Christians in this city. Now turn back to Ephesians 2.19, because Paul switches the metaphor halfway through the verse, and he goes from talking about the city of God to saying that, that as Christians, verse 19, we are members of the household of God. So this, this is the church, point number two, as the family of God. 
the family of God. Household is a rich word. This word household conveys refuge in a family, a place outside of the hustle and bustle, a place outside of the conflict where there's safety and protection. This is the the place where you get your identity, your family. This is the security that comes from belonging to a close-knit, loving family. All of that is conveyed by this word household. So that through faith in Christ, you who were once far off, we, you, we who are slaves to sin and enemies of God are now family. We are adopted children of God. Now the first time I preached this message, it was, it was seminary and I, I remember preaching it and then I walk out to my car and I found, uh, my phone was in the car at the time and um, I found a message on my phone. My dad was telling me that my grandfather was about to pass away. I loved my grandpa. He hated that I wanted to be a pastor. He's like, I hate that you chose to do that. I'm saying, like, like really, I'd choose to do this? You know, this is a calling, but whatever. You know, he, there's no way for him to know that. But, and I don't, I, I, if I remember correctly, he didn't talk to me for three straight years because I was one of those hucksters that was re- using religion to steal people's money and all that. Well, we reconciled about six months before he died, and he even left me an inheritance. Why? Because we're family, because we're blood. Now, in the church, in this church, we, we all have been adopted by the same father. Amen. We all have the same, we're, we're all fellow heirs with Jesus, our brother. We all have the same spirit in us. We, we, we all have the same spiritual blood coursing through our veins. This is, this is not what we're striving for. This is not what we hope to be someday. This is what we, what does the text say? Are. This is reality. This is more true than anything we experience in church. No one is more family than the other. No one has more standing or status than the other. Members of God's household means as you look around this room, we are all brothers and sisters. Regardless of our ethnicity, how many degrees we have or don't have, how much money we have or don't have, how old or young we are, none of that matters at all. Our sinful hearts want to make those things the things that matter most. And Paul says, no, we are all part of the family of God, all of us. And so that word household in verse 19, well, let me back up and say this. If you look around like right now, there is nothing like church. You think about it, like where else do you, do you meet with people from all these different backgrounds, from all of these different Uh, experiences from all of these different cultures where else can we come together in a room like this all worship the same God all love the same Jesus all be be, sing the same songs hear the same message like where else do you do this you're hard-pressed if you could say like well maybe like a sports fan you know maybe like a sporting venue you know people from all ages and all that okay but where 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 everything that's happening here is all for the glory of God There's no place else like this. There really isn't. This is the household. This is the family of God. This is the city of God. And then the third and final metaphor we're going to look at today is the home of God in verses 20 to 22. So Paul is going to highlight three features of this home. This home has three features. The first is the home's foundation. Look at verse 20. This household of God, notice, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. So notice he's describing this temple at at its base, and he says there that God has been building the temple, notice verse 20, on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. So an apostle is is a man sent by God on a mission. He has the full authority of his master. He proclaims the message in the stead of his master, and whether that's done in writing or whether that's done from his voice, that's the job of an apostle. And then there's the prophet. The prophet is gifted by the Spirit to edify, comfort, encourage the church, as well as their job is to understand and then communicate the divine message to the church. And that might include telling the future, but a lot of times it doesn't. It just includes, here's God's message. So the point here is that both offices are revelational. They're they're both speaking the words of God, meaning that both apostles and prophets received information directly from God himself. Sometimes then they spoke their message, sometimes they wrote that message down, but it's revelation, that's the idea. Apostles, prophets, revelation. As an aside, question for you, it's really not an aside, it comes from the text. Do you keep adding to the foundation once you build on the building? 
Right? Yeah, you don't do that. You don't add to the foundation once you start building the building, unless you really screwed up the foundation. You don't need to do that, right? Why is that significant? Well, the reason that's significant is because if the apostles and prophets of the New Testament, if those are the foundation, that means we're not adding more apostles and prophets. It means those are all done. Why? Because they're the foundation. And we don't build on top of the foundation after the foundation. We don't build the foundation after it's been laid and after we've been putting stuff on top of it. No, that would mean a really screwed up foundation. But if you look at verse 20, there's nothing screwed up about this foundation because notice the, no, notice the very beginning of this foundation is what? It is Christ Jesus himself, the cornerstone. So you've got Christ Jesus, the cornerstone. We'll come back to that in a second. And then you have the, the New Testament apostles and prophets. Why is it the New Testament apostles and prophets? Well, one apostle comes before prophet. But in chapter 3, verse 5, or 4 and 5, it says, When you read this, Paul says, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. The mystery of Christ is what we're talking about here. It's the church. And he says, This mystery, which had not been made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed. So the, so the church wasn't revealed in the past. He says it was revealed now. And who was it revealed to? What does it say? His holy apostles and what? Prophets. So who are the prophets in the New Testament? Mark, Luke, James, Jude, and the writer to the Hebrews. Those are five. Those are the writing prophets. There are others, Agabus and others, who were prophets in the New Testament. Well, who are the apostles who wrote? Matthew, John, Paul, and Peter. There are other apostles. They weren't writers. They were preachers only. These guys preached and wrote. So we've got the foundation, which is their revelation. Well, where is that revelation now? Where is that speaking now? It's right here in the writings of the apostles and prophets that we still have today. So today it's their written revelation that was later copied and compiled. It became the New Testament that becomes the foundation for every faithful church on the planet today. But I want you to notice that's the minor part of the foundation. The major part of the foundation is the cornerstone. Look at that in verse 20. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Cornerstone was critically important for a building. Back in the day, when you wanted to build a building, you, you needed to pick the most perfect stone to build your building. It had to be perfect 90 degree angles on every side and every place it had to be perfect 90 degrees. If it was off even slightly, just by a slight degree, your whole building would not work. Your whole building would be weak and deficient and could even fall because everything that happened came from that cornerstone. So every, every single um, stone horizontally was fit to that cornerstone. So if those were, if that was in a perfect 90 degree angle and every stone perfect 90 degree fit uh, horizontally, the whole thing wouldn't work well. And the same is true vertically. If it wasn't a perfect fit, 90 degree angles all the way up, the whole structure would be weak. Well, think about Jesus. Is he perfect 90 degree angles everywhere? You bet, you bet. That's a perfect illustration for him. Yeah, depending on him for stability, yeah. Depending on him for shape and for, for, for connection, for everything, yeah, you can depend on him for everything. Every part of the structure of the church depends on him. Everything goes to him. Everything flows from him. Everything flows to him. This, there's no slight imperfection in him. He's, and notice verse 20 where it says, the word himself where it says that Christ Jesus himself, when, when Paul does that, puts that word in there, what he's saying is Jesus and no one else. There is no one but Jesus alone who gives shape and coherence, stability and strength to God's home. He has this unique position, this, this unsurpassed significance. He is everything. The entire church depends on him. So this is the foundation, but notice number two in verse 11, I'm sorry, verse 21, the, the, home, the, the home's formation. So you've got the foundation, now the formation of verse 21. Uh, it says there, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. So the building is being, now he's, he's talking about, so the foundation is laid and now it's being built on. Notice those words in verse 21, being joined together. Notice this is an ongoing process. 
people are constantly being added, placed into the superstructure of the building on that foundation. So it's a perfect illustration. Jesus being the cornerstone, the apostles and prophets making up the rest of the foundation, then everything being built on Jesus and their revelation in the New Testament. It's perfect. So everyone connected to the apostles and prophets. There's never going to be another prophet. There's no need for any other prophets. We have everything we need. Everything is built on top of them. And so joined together, notice that verse 21, it conveys great care that, 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 they were, that, that, that we're not talking about subpar craftsmanship. We have a, a bench in our, in our bathroom that was subpar craftsmanship. And so within like a month of, of this new shower, and we're so excited, there's cracks all through the tile in that thing. Just subpar. And the idea with this word joined together is that's impossible because it's God who's putting us together. It's God who's putting people together in the church universal, in this, in this temple of God, but also in each and every local church. He's fitting us together. And it's perfect. There's nothing careless, subpar, defective about this craftsmanship. Notice verse, verse 21 again, that word together. That word is, conveys harmo- harmony and unity and coordination each stone having its place, each stone being carefully placed, connected to the foundation, connected to the other stones around it. This Jesus has been building this church. Since he said, I will build my church, Matthew 16, 18, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. This is what he's doing, is he's building his church one salvation at a time and building it together into what? Notice what it says in verse 21, into a holy temple. Now that word temple doesn't refer to all the outer courts and the whole complex. That word temple speaks of the, the special place, the holy of holies, the place where God's presence dwelled. He said, you're not part of the outer courts. You're not part, you're not part of the, 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 the extension or the, the, the whole complex. You are as close as you could possibly be to God with other Christians around you. So in Christ, Christians have gone from being separated to sanctified, from slaves to sons to interconnected bricks in a structure called a holy temple, a special place. In other words, where where you as a Christian get to be as close as possible to the God of the universe, so much so that you are an individual temple. But when all of us get together and all of us individual temples come together together, and worship our king. We're now in a room where God dwells. God doesn't dwell in this room when you're not here. You know that, right? This is just a shell. This is just a, this is, there's nothing holy about this place until you show up. And when you show up, you bring the holy God with you. And when that happens, it's electric. Something is going on here because God is here with you. And that's what he's doing. That, that, and so this, this unity that, that we're all built together into this perfect structure called the church. And then there's this function at the, in verse 22. So the foundation, verse 20, formation, verse 21, and the function in verse 22. Isn't that cute? Verse 22, in him, in Jesus, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Think about that. So we've been saying, but here he just makes it plain. God is doing this. Jesus is putting all of this together to be a place where the God of the universe is pleased to dwell. That word dwell is more than just like, oh, I'm like hanging out for a little bit. It speaks of permanence and endurance. It speaks of fellowship and protection and love. The idea here is that the function of this temple, the function of the church is is to give God a place to call home where he settles down and he never leaves. You don't need to go to temples. You are temple. You are the temple. And when we're all together, it creates a temple where God himself right now is dwelling. You are in a holy, special place. Just like every other church out there where Jesus is loved, the Bible was founded on the scriptures, just like we saw when that's taking place, there is a temple. That is where God's people, but that is where God's presence dwells. I have a deaf friend. Um, We... I love him dearly. We were both custodians together at a church, and we would try to communicate, and it was not easy. It was not easy. We would... I didn't, I, I didn't know sign language and he couldn't speak. And so there was always this awkwardness of trying to, to speak with him. Um, 
but it didn't stop us. Like we get out pieces of paper, we draw things in the air, we do whatever we needed to do to communicate because we loved each other. We're, we're, the, we're great friends. Whenever I see him, when I go back to that church, it's all we pick up right where we left off and then I realize like I still can't communicate with you. <laughs> you know? but one of the best ways that we communicated was drawing pictures. We'd, get out, we'd have a little piece of paper, we'd draw like on the walls with our fingers. We'd, we'd just try to communicate and the best thing we did was draw pictures. We'd just point at something and be like, oh yeah, I get it now. Because we, we had a visual, once we had a visual, we could communicate. And that's what Paul's doing here in this passage. He's giving us visuals in order to tell us this is what life should be like in your church. This is what it is. This is the reality. But if this is what it is, let's be who we are. Let's be who we are. And that's kind of how I want to close today. So if this passage compares our church to the city of God, it means that point number one, we should be at peace with each other. We should be at peace with each other. In Ephesians 2, look at Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. In Ephesians 4, 1, the whole book switches. The whole book uh, uh, flips, and it goes from a lot of doctrine and teachings and theology to practice. And I want you to notice the first thing he looks at, the first thing he says, this is what you should be, is what we've been talking about today. Look at 4, 1. Therefore, I therefore... A prisoner for the Lord, urge you, urge you Christians, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. So you've been called, you've had this, you have this incredible calling. And like in our passage, you have this calling as the city of God, the family of God, and the home of God. That's your calling. That's what you are. He says, you have this high calling, so walk in a manner worthy of that calling. What would that look like? Verse two, that would look like all humility and gentleness. That would look like patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Now listen to all this unity language in verse four. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. All, 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 one, one, one. There's all this unity, all this togetherness. But notice verse three. The Holy Spirit has accomplished this by by going out into the world, rescuing people, saving them as they believe the gospel. But notice verse 3. What would it look like to walk in a manner worthy of the calling that we've been given? It would look like being eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The, the, The Spirit has already accomplished the unity. What's our job? eagerly maintain it. That word eager means having a keen interest in. That means having an intense desire. And, it's, and this word is in the present tense, meaning that it should be on our radar. It should be something we're thinking about. How do I maintain the unity here? How do I notice at the end of the verse, maintain the, the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, that there's a chain, there's glue, there's this bond. And what is that bond? It is the peace between us. He says that is something that we should be eager to maintain. We should, be, we should be given to seeking to maintaining this. And in a growing church like this one, the newness kind of wears off. And then, then we start to see like, oh, what's really going on here? Like I have three kids. I've got a, I've got a 12-week-old. And I've got a three-year-old and a five-year-old. So my 12-week-old... It's just a constant moving forward. It's just a constant moving towards her. There is nothing about her that's like, oh, I don't, want, I don't want anything to do with that. There's just this constant love and I want more and more and try to make her smile and all that. Then there's the three and the five-year-old. You know? Now, you're laughing because you know, like we love them infinitely, right? Like we love them intensely. But sometimes it's like, put, like I want to be close and other times it's like, whoa, you need to back off, Right? Like, like as, as they move out of this infant stage and into the toddler stage, there's this, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And that's the same thing that happens in a church. We're three years old as a church right now, you know? And so we're not that infant, oh, isn't that cute? No, oh, they're trying to figure things out, blah, blah, blah. Now we're in that toddler stage. We're like, oh, what's going on here? <laughs> it was funny. It was cute, you know, when you were two, but, you know. Like, that's what's happening. And, and so right now, it's easy for strife to begin. It's easy for factions to develop. It's easy to see, see the growth and the change and all of that and think the worst and impugn motives and get suspicious and all of that stuff. It's easy to stop choosing to trust and to start believing the worst instead of the best about people and all of that stuff. 
In other words, it's easy to not be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. And the thing that happens is that disunity loves company. And so then we rally other people to our cause. But here's the thing. The city of God is not a city at war. The city of God is where peace reigns. There are times to go to war in the city of God, and that's two. Two times to go to war in the city of God. One is false doctrine. We've been seeing that all through Galatians. And two is unrepentant sin. Other than that, there's no other reason. What happens is that secondary pet theological issues become everything or preferences and opinions rise to the level of good and evil and what I like becomes what everybody else should like and we're not being the city of God. We're not being a family or home either. Remember Jesus taught us to pray on earth as it is in heaven and will there be any conflict in heaven? There won't. Now, of course, we still struggle with sin. Of course, there's still going to be conflict. But the unity of heaven should be first experienced among us. It should first be experienced here. So let's be eager to be and stay at peace. So this passage compares us to the family of God. Then point number two, you and I should stick together no matter what. Stick together no matter what. Now, other than moving away, you know, there are times to not stick together. What are those times? There are two. False doctrine, unrepentant sin. Other than that, we should stick together. Now, if you're like, this is my first time, I don't know if I want to stick together with you people. That's fine. Totally fine. But that's the goal, no matter where you end up going to church, is I'm going to stick. I'm going to get to know people. I'm going to, I'm going to get to know them and let them get to know me. I'm, I, this is getting, like a family. Like, when I was a teenager, I, I would come out of my, my cave grab dinner and go back to my cave and that was it like I stayed in my little cave all the time and that was it that's great that's you know that's what teenagers do but we can't do that as a family that doesn't work that that doesn't cause good family relationships that's what many do right we come to church we sit just kind of watch watch somebody else do use their gifts as we sing or whatnot and then we go home that's like bringing teenager you or teenager me into the church and go, oh, no, that's fine. I just kind of cruise in and cruise out. It's like, no. The goal is that you find a family. If it's not here, it's somewhere where you find people that can get involved in your life, where you, where you can find people that you can get involved in their lives and they get to know you. And, and when something happens in your life, there's a flood of people that, that come and support you. Yeah, there's family and friends and that's true, but God has created the church in order to be that for you as well, that we are a family. Now, fam, like even saying that word, that might not fill your heart with warm fuzzies. That may have been the, the source of strife in your heart. I mean, I was talking with a guy on Wednesday, and he said to me, you know, family's fine. He said, the church has been the problem. He said, I'd bring my kids to church, and you know, and they're going, and great, and then there was a church split. And my kids are like, uh, Dad, what's that all about? And then they give another church a chance, and, another, and, it's, and the church splits again. And he's like, my kids haven't been to church in 25 years. They had those two experiences and went, yeah, it's not for me. That's not a family. That's not a family at all. And it might be our families. Like that, that may have happened in your family where there was a split. But you are part of another family. You are part of the family of God. And you and I should do nothing that brings those conflicts and strifes and suspicions and angst from the world and from our flesh into the church. Each of us, if you look around right now, you're all brothers and sisters. Even the one making noise over there, like we're all brothers and sisters, (laughs) you know. No, I love that sound. Do you know why? Because it's new life. It's new people. It's like God is, is bringing more and more people and it's fantastic. It's a blessing. But if we don't have this idea that whoever walks in here is family and that we want, we want to welcome them into the family. We, want, we don't want to be insular. We don't want to be inward focused. We want to be outward focused so that people sense like I belong here and more and more people can belong here because we're a family. We're not exclusive. We're inclusive of anybody no matter what they look like, who they are, what's happened. If our Savior accepts everybody, then that's the message we should convey to everybody. So I want you to see this. So turn two books to the right to Colossians chapter three. Colossians chapter three. This this church was full of strife. There's false teaching in it that's tearing it apart. As a result of that false teaching, there's conflict and there's strife. And so Paul writes to them and says, hey, here's how you should be. Here's how you should be. Colossians chapter three, verse 12. 
If you're looking for it, page 1088 in those blue Bibles. Colossians 3.12. It's instead of that strife, instead of that conflict, he says, verse 12, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. He says, there's your calling. That's what you are. You're holy. You're separate. You're loved by God. That's what you are. So here's how you should live. Compassionate hearts. Put that on. Kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another. That means putting up with one another. All of this stuff assumes that there's conflict. And he's like, okay, even though there's conflict, bear with one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. Well, what's the standard I should, I should use for forgiveness? As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Well, how did God forgive you? Think about the forgiveness that you've been shown, believer. He's forgiven you eternally. He's not bringing it up, you know, like a couple weeks around. I was like, hey, you remember that time? Yeah, I don't think you were sufficiently uh, repentant about that. So I need to bring this up to you again to make sure that like, you got it all out this time, right? He forgave you completely. He's not holding anything back, you know. Jesus doesn't die for 99% of your sins. You got 1%, so you're like, ah, you know, you know, you got to take care of that one. No, you're forgiven eternally. You're forgiven completely. And, and Paul goes, that's how you should treat each other. Look at verse 14. And above all this, so above what? Above compassion and humility and patience and forgiveness. Above all of that, put on love which binds, there's that word again, which binds, which cements, which, which glues everything together in perfect harmony. That's what it should be like. Perfect harmony. Let's be marked by that. And finally, if this, if this passage compares our church to the temple or the home of God, it means that all of us are like bricks and we're all put together. Then, then the way should, we, what, what we could, should get from that, I think, is point number three, that we should see ourselves as interconnected. See yourselves as interconnected. Now, this works against the, uh, the American ideal of rugged individualism as we're talking now on Independence Day. We're independent you know, we, we're our own, we're the master of our own ships, you know, the captains of our own destiny. We're our own personal popes or presidents. And, and all of that works against what I'm talking about now, feeling interconnected, being interconnected. So I want you to turn to one more passage. Turn to John 17. John 17. This is just hours before Jesus dies. He's alone with the Father. He knows he's going to die, so he is focused on the things that are most important to him. And you might, there are all kinds of things that you might think this is the most important thing. Well, I want you to see what Jesus saw as this is the most important thing. Just, just hours before he's executed, look at verse 20. John 17, 20. I do not ask for these only. He's talking about the 11 Judas is already gone. I, I don't ask for these apostles only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. There's that foundation again. They're going to preach my message, and people are going to believe in me through these apostles, and that's what happens. That's what we've done with, with their word. That's what we've done in the scriptures. I'm praying for those who will believe in me through their message, verse 21, that they may all be happy. Is that what your Bible says? that they may all be rich. Does that, your Bible have that? No? Prosperity heresy study Bible? You don't have that? No? I know I take shots at them all the time, but I hate, I hate what they do. Because they take stuff like this and say that's not important. What's really important is this fleshly stuff. Notice what it says, that they may all be one. What standard? Just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be, be, be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. Just like that, that man was telling me, my kids have left church because they've seen all this. But Jesus says, he gives non-Christians a test and says, our unity will be the proof that we are actually his followers, that we will be one so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory that you've given me, verse 22, I have given them that they may be one, even as we are one. 
I and them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one, together, united in harmony. Why? Not for our own benefit only, but in this passage, notice why. So that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. I have a tree, my, my neighbor has a tree in the backyard, and um, it's a Palo Verde tree, and I hate it. <laughs> you know, and you, you who live around one or have one, you know what I'm talking about. It's great, like, in the late afternoon, it, it gives shade to our backyard, and it's fantastic, but it drops just pounds of trash all over our, 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 our yard and then into our pool, like pounds of just garbage in our pool constantly in the spring. And my, my neighbor's like cutting it all down. And he's trying to do his best to keep it under control. But the problem is really not what's above the ground. It's, it's what's underneath the ground. The roots are growing in such a way that it's actually tearing our, our, our fence apart. And so if you were to come to my house and stand in the backyard, you could actually see through our cinder block wall. Because there are all these cracks in this wall. And, it's, and the structure, could, I hope not, but eventually the structure could come down. Now, we so often see ourselves as individual Christians with our own private lives and our own personal relationships with Jesus. But this passage, what Jesus' prayer is talking about is what we saw in Ephesians 2, that you and I are cemented together. We are glued together. That we are all this cemented in this, in this building of human beings that houses the actual presence of God. So as you go back to your car today, you're going to see our cinder block walls. You know, around our church. And, and, and as you look at those, it should remind you of the interconnectedness of, of God's church universal. But it also should, it should say this is what it should look like. Those walls are what it should, the experience looks like, the experience that we should have here. Not just here in thousands of local churches all around the world, but, but even here. Millions. We must encourage this unity. We must celebrate this unity. We must fight for this unity. And it starts in our own hearts. And it starts in my own heart saying, I'm going to be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace because this is my family. We stick together as a family because we are interconnected. Now, when I was 16, my grandma and I, we took a 2,000 mile trip from Orange County, California, where I'm from, to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And on the way, we stopped in Chicago and we visited the Sears Tower. It is 1,700 feet high, has 110 floors. It's the tallest building in North America, third tallest in the world. That might not be true. That changes. People are constantly building. So at one point, it was the third tallest in the world. Now, the observation deck is 1,353 feet high. And on a clear day, they say that you can see 40 to 50 miles from that observation deck. It's an engineering masterpiece. I could go through all the details. I've got them all here. It's just astounding. It's incredible. It is by far the most impressive building I've ever seen or ever been in. And I remember standing in that observation deck, and I remember, you know, you're standing on the glass, and you're looking down, and, like, cars look like ants, right? And, and people, like, you could barely make out people from way up there. It's just so, they're so small. This is this engineering masterpiece. And maybe you've never been there. Maybe you've been to the Eiffel Tower or the Empire State Building or the Ark in St. Louis or somewhere else where you're just standing in awe of, or maybe, maybe one of the, the, the dams that we have around here. You, you look out here, it's like, this is an engineering masterpiece, and it's true. It's architectural genius. It's precise construction. It's tremendous size. But honestly, it pales in comparison to the church of Jesus Christ. This is a truly glorious place. Unlike the glory that we see in those other buildings, this has real glory because in the church, the presence of God is housed in the people of God. Think of her foundation the New Testament, think of, think of the apostles and prophets, they're right. Think about the cornerstone, Jesus. There's no other foundation in any building like that. And somewhere at the top of that massive structure is you and you and you and all of us. And, and, and this is, this, we, we're there housing the presence of God. We're all members of the family of God. We're all residents in God's city. And in case you've been wondering, you're sitting there, you know, maybe it's your first time or... Or maybe it's not your first time. If you're wondering like, hey, you know, what's really going on here at this church? You know, they got some strife going on. There really isn't any one reason why I thought, well, I want to preach about this today. 
You know, I, I, like I said before, I had another message in Galatians. We're making our way through that. I just thought, I just kept over and over thinking about this and going, no, I think I need to preach on this message. I think I need to, as, as, we've, as we've, we're three years old as a church, a little bit more than three years old now, I just thought, yeah, I think we need to talk about this. It's kind of like, th- things are really great here, but, but it's, like, it's like the parent that's trying to look ahead and see the dangers that they want their children to avoid. So that's what this message is for our church. It's, being, it's looking ahead and going, yeah, things have been really great for a while, but there are three ways that churches are attacked. The first is false doctrine, false teachers that worm their way in here and start to faction people off through false teaching. The second is through persecution. Persecution hits a body of believers, it causes people to scatter. But the third is disunity. And I'm sure if I gave you the microphone right now, you could come up here and tell me all kinds of ways that you've been in churches that have just crushed your soul through disunity. And I look at that, I read the New Testament, I see the dangers that these churches face that Paul and the other apostles wrote to, and I pray, God, protect us. I've been praying for months, protect us from false teachers as we go through Galatians. But in thinking about this, like, God, protect us. Protect us from disunity. Let's believe the best. Let's choose to trust. Let's never mimic the Hatfields and McCoys or the Kardashians or whatever conflict-ridden group of people there is on television now. Let's just always, let's, let's try to be what we actually are. Let's, let's stay what we already are, united, peaceful, together, interconnected in this small little part of God's city, this, this tiny little part of God's family, this infinitesimal little section of God's home called Redeemer Bible Church, okay? Okay, let's pray. God, thank you for a passage like this, and thank you. Thank you for working in our hearts to bring about the unity that we really can't find anywhere else in the world. God, we, we need you to do this more. And in a message like this, everything that I've said today may not have applied to anything anyone is experiencing in this church, and that's great. But it could happen right now as we're done. It could happen as we get our kids from kids ministry. It could happen as we're out getting coffee and a donut. It could happen in the youth ministry. It could happen amongst the staff. It could happen amongst the elders. God, please protect this church from disunity. Please help us, please, to be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. So that our kids here and, and, and those who aren't kids will have no excuse. That they won't see that kind of strife happen in a place like this. I don't want to believe for a second that we're immune to that. We're not. You tell us that those who think they stand should take heed lest they fall. So I want to be humble and I want to recognize that that could happen here. And so I ask for your protection, but I know that you protect us through people, through all of us. So I ask that you would do that, please. I beg you to do that. Protect us from this kind of thing, tearing apart your city, your family, your home, this little small part of it here at Redeemer Bible Church. It's in your name that I pray, Jesus. Amen.